This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Steve Iadarola, Jeffrey Zilks, and Tony Glass. Coming up on DTNS, what we do and don't know about the FAA computer crash in the United States. Netflix is moving into live streams, and scientists find no evidence that Twitter disinformation affected the 2016 U.S. presidential election. We'll explain. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, January 11th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chick. All right, folks, we are well into 2023 at this point. CES uh, lingering behind us. We still got some more analysis to do of that coming up, but not, uh, not necessarily in today's show. Let's start with the quick hits. Twitter began rolling out changes to feed appearances on iOS, now showing two tab feeds, For You and Following. For You will show when opening the app, which will offer an algorithmically driven feed similar to the old home feed. Following will show you a chronological feed of followed accounts similar to latest tweets. Users can swipe between the two, but no word on when the new feeds will come to Android. On its Discord server, a human representative of OpenAI uh, said that the company has begun starting to think about how to monetize ChatGPT through a version called ChatGPT Professional as a way to, quote, ensure the tool's long-term viability. The company posted a waitlist link in Discord asking potential customers questions about pricing. Apple analyst Ming-Chi Kuo expects Apple to release the first MacBook with an OLED display by the end of 2024 at the earliest. Meanwhile, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman sources say that Apple plans to start using its own custom displays on mobile devices as early as 2024 as well, starting with switching from OLED to micro-LED displays on high-end Apple Watches and eventually the iPhone. Uh, add the following to your calendar. we got a couple of events. Xbox and Bethesda, our host Bethesda, it's easy for you to say, will host a Developer Direct event on January 25th at 3 p.m. Uh, they're going to be talking about Forza Motorsport, Minecraft Legends, Elder Scrolls Online, as well as which titles are going to come to Xbox, PC, and Game Pass in the next few months. That event will be streamed on Twitch and YouTube. Samsung is also going to hold its own event, Galaxy Unpacked, the first one of 2023 on February 1st in San Francisco. First one in person in a couple of years. That'll happen at 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Samsung will stream the event on its site and on YouTube. Expected updates there would be another Galaxy S phone, the Galaxy S23 uh, series, and new Galaxy Book laptops. Alphabet graduated its X moonshot factory computational agriculture project, Mineral, into a full Alphabet company. Mineral works on using generative, uh, generative AI and also machine learning and edge compute hardware to develop sensing tech for richer plant, plant data sets and organizing crop data across disparate sources. All right. So there we go. M. I think they already had an M, but M added to the alphabet. <laughs> Let's talk about that outage. Let's do it. So at 2 a.m. on Wednesday morning, the U.S. aviation's agency's notice to air missions, or NOTAM, system crashed. It required a hard reset. Uh, <laughs> apologies to anybody who was flying this morning. In the words of Captain Brian Hoffman, who wrote in about this uh, and knows a lot about this stuff, NOTAM tells pilots about issues like a closed runway or taxiway due to construction or airspace that is closed, say, due to military usage, to name a few examples. Now, this is information that can be conveyed to each pilot individually as needed, but that doesn't really scale. So the automated system is necessary if you want to have the thousands of flights in the air, which we do. Yeah, uh, the BBC uh, did an article about this and pointed out this, this system's been around since 1947. It used to be done by telephone. Uh, it is not anymore. But uh, if we want to have those flights that, that Sarah's talking about, uh, you, you need a lot of notifications and you need them easy to get. 21,464 flights were scheduled on Wednesday. So flights already in the air 
were safe. There was no disruption to you if you were in the air because this is just notifications that you either already saw before you took off or they, they could talk to you in, if you're in the air and tell you what you need to know. Flights were delayed from taking off, though, until the automated system got back to normal operations. Departures began again at around 8.15 a.m. Eastern on Wednesday. The FAA is investigating why the system crashed, uh, but U- U.S. officials said there was no evidence of a cyber attack. My my question is, how old is this system? And we know the FAA requires redundancies. Uh, I'm not doubting that there were redundancies. Uh, so my question isn't, why weren't there redundancies? Is why did the redundancies fail? Why Why did this system have to do a hard reset? Yeah, it's easy to look at this and go, well, it must be based on some old technology. What are they running? Windows uh, 98? Uh, you know, this sort of attitude. Um, I don't. Who knows what they actually use? I know that it, that this is this feels like a rare event. I, you don't hear a lot about the FAA being the outage point. You hear about airlines having trouble, but that's usually, you know, within their own realm. We had a listener to FilmSack write in and say they were taxiing when the word came in that they couldn't leave. So literally, they're about to take a turn and take off when the captain says, oh, "Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have to not do this," and they had to go back and. And dump everybody off. In fact, I think they had to sit on the tarmac for a while just to deal with it. But uh, I guess hearts go out to everyone who had to deal with that. Because that's kind of a nightmare. And I feel really bad for them. No fun. Yeah, I think um, especially having, uh, I mean, I am not myself a pilot, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite into the idea of the pilot universe. I have heard... From quite a few pilots, like especially like you know flying PJ stuff, that uh, yeah, you you think that pilots need more information than they actually need. Not to say that this is not important, but once you're in the air, you know, for anybody who is like, oh gosh, you know, it you know is everybody you know on a plane right now safe? Uh, you know, are they going to crash? No, for the most part, pilots. They 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 know what they're doing. This is all information that is uh, more about taking off and landing. Yeah, mm-hmm. and 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 stuff you can tell the pilot. You can say like, "Hey, runway five is closed. Uh, use runway four. But when you have yeah. a dozen air traffic controllers and thousands of planes, uh, it's easier to have a system that just automatically feeds that information to, to folks. Uh, these notams are, are, are apparently pages and pages long, too, right? So you wouldn't have someone yeah. sit there and read hundreds of pages of information uh, to, to all the pilots out there, which is why you, why you need this, this system at the scale at, at which we operate. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here waiting like, okay, this wasn't dangerous. I get why they had to ground planes not that the planes couldn't fly it's just too many planes to to fly as safely as we want them to fly but what was that system running on uh yeah. why did it crash uh why did they have to do a hard yeah. reset why wasn't it's- there a failover do they have the system in multiple places was it just in one place was it a power outage you know th- these are all the questions i have yeah. exactly like if it wasn't a cyber attack which is great what did happen mm-hmm. yeah yeah i love that it wasn't a cyber attack that was good news but I don't know. I look at this sort of thing and think they could be more transparent about that. I I'd, I'd, I want answers to everything Tom just asked him. Why is it a problem that we we would know that? Maybe there's a, a security issue by letting people know what systems this is running on. Well, what okay. kind of coding is involved? Have that you sort of looked thing? I don't know. to find out if the it, what what the uh, what the system runs on? I, I looked around. Could. I looked around and couldn't find anything, but yeah. my my brain goes to Unix, Linux, you know. Before before I accuse them of lack of transparency, I want to make sure I've exhausted all my lanes of, uh, you know, maybe it's over there somewhere and I just didn't know where to look, right? Sure, sure. Um, yeah. What what I think is responsible for them, too, is to say, hey, we're not going to speculate on what could have caused it until we're sure. Uh, yeah. And so I, I I think they're they're looking into like, okay, we think it was this, but as with any computer crash, it's there's a difference between fixing the crash and knowing what caused the crash, right? Yeah, I agree. Well, let's move on to some Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, everyone's favorite turtles. Shredder's Revenge was a game that launched a little while ago on Xbox, PlayStation, and Nintendo Switch, but it is now coming out on iOS and Android from none other than Netflix and will be a mobile exclusive for Netflix subscribers. So that seems cool. Yeah, I... Yeah. <laughs> uh, in other Netflix news, whether or not you're excited about this game or not, uh, Netflix reached a multi-year partnership with the Screen Actors Guild 
to live stream the SAG Awards. That's starting in 2024. The show will also be streamed on Netflix's YouTube channel. The company will host its first live stream content on March 4th at 10 p.m. Eastern, where you can watch Chris Rock, Selective Outrage. Uh, the show will be streamed from Baltimore and then be made available on demand uh, on Netflix after that. So when Chris Rock's streaming uh, event was announced, I thought, well, that's interesting. Netflix is testing live streaming and they're testing it with what is going to be a very popular live stream uh, because everybody wants to hear what Chris Rock has to say about what happened at the Oscars with Will mm-hmm. Smith. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm like, okay, this might be just a toe dab. Uh, when I saw the the news about the Screen Actors Guild Awards coming to Netflix in 2024, I actually found that more interesting because the SAG Awards are something you see on Bravo. They're not expected to get a huge audience, but they always get an audience. There's people who just love award shows. I mean, and, I'm I'm one of those people. Right? For sure. Right. And yeah. so, so Netflix getting that is like taking away some of that secondary cable. As we're going to watch cable die, some of that secondary cable content is going to have to go elsewhere. Here it goes. One of them's going to Netflix. And it means Netflix is open to streaming things that don't have to be super popular to justify it. That the, That implies to me that they are going to be doing a lot of live streams and award shows might be among those. I mean, award shows, you know, I always tell people I don't really need cable TV or even like network television, except for things Mm -hmm. like sports and award shows because it's appointment viewing. You really, you know, if you, if you care about the SAG awards, for example, you, you're going to watch it wherever it may be. So I think that this is really lucrative for, you know, the variety of companies who are going to, I mean, it's kind of like Amazon and Thursday night football, you know, it's, it's all sort of the same thing. Yeah. I like, I like that Netflix is finally showing us what they're going to do, but it also feels very familiar to me in the playbook of Netflix and same thing with their mobile game uh, stuff that we just talked about with the Ninja Turtles. They start slow. They start with a thing that isn't the Oscars, but it's a interesting award show, maybe even a little more prestige in some ways. You know, some people take that thing more seriously than the Oscars and they're going to put that <laughs> thing out and guild. say, exactly. Yes. But they're like, here, we're going to start here and then we're going to see where it takes us. How about a comedy uh, stream or a, a live concert with Chris Rock? That sounds good. Uh, then they'll build it out from there. That seems like the Netflix way. They don't start with spending all their money on a big flashy moment. They work with small stuff and see how it pans out over time, including original programming in the early days. And I think that's this is just part of their playbook and will probably work for them as a result. Yeah, I, I look at this and I think, OK, Netflix uh, was making noise about sports last year. But basically, if, if I'm reading the tea leaves right, said it's too expensive. We would have to have a lot more control over a sports deal in order to make it work. Similar to why Apple didn't end up getting NFL Sunday ticket. They, they wanted fewer blackouts. They wanted more control over the streams. I think Netflix is even more so that way. But they definitely want to do live. So what else are they going to do? What, uh, sure, they're going to do other award shows. I think that that could be a given. Uh, what about news? Because news is the other live thing that people talk about. And wouldn't it be interesting if a Netflix news product came out of this? If once they're like, yeah, we can do live. So we're going to do live news sometimes or breaking news. I don't know. A Netflix news department sounds crazy, but at this point they've done a lot of things like ad supported and now live that, that they had said they weren't going to do before. I'd be curious if they do that. Well, mm-hmm. and a Netflix news department that is successful would be the absolute best way for everyone to say, oh, yeah, I mean, I go to Netflix for my news the way that I would go to CNN or Fox or whatever. Uh, it hasn't really been tested and done at this point, but why not? Yeah. I'd, I mean, I would at least – I watch very little news because I think it's all kind of bad. Uh, just the way they do it. I don't like the format of, of Scott, modern news. News is fine. Hundred percent me. I, I don't want ever. I'm not blanketing <laughs> everybody else's opinion, but I find news to be just laborious to watch. And it, could they do something interesting in that? Yeah, space? could they Maybe. something different? Where they're because they're yeah. not beholden to making and you what, watch every like, and, like and that's, cable news is. Yeah. That's kind yeah, of the exactly. question. Is like how would it be different? You know, for somebody like Scott, who's like, ah, you know, the news is just like such a bummer. <laughs> just you know, I really don't want to consume this. How could it be done differently by a company like Netflix? Yeah, yeah I and, don't uh, know. 
CBS, ABC, NBC, they all have free news apps that are ad supported. Netflix now has ads. Could they do something free outside of their paywall? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yep, the entirely mind, possible. That's where my mind has been going with this stuff. Also, clarification. Uh, we, we mentioned the show will be streamed on Netflix's YouTube channel. That's just for this year. This year, they're going to do it on the YouTube channel. And then as of next year, it'll only be on Netflix. If you're like, well, wait, why are they even putting it on Netflix if they're going to put it on YouTube? That's a, it's a temporary measure. And one tiny bone thrown to the gamers real quick. This All Teenage right. Mutant Ninja Turtles game, very successful on consoles and PC in its initial run. People really like it. It's an amazing throwback to the to the 90s games. However, I don't think the support's controller. I was just trying to find out. So I'm just saying that may not be your preferred way to play it. Touch screens are kind of lame when it comes to games like that. Yeah. There you go. Side well, note complete. You can do that. Can, yeah, never mind. Uh, if you're feeling social and you want to say, Tom, Scott, Sarah, you uh, you should know this, uh, get in touch with us on social networks. DTNS Show on Twitter, Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, and DTNS Picks with an X, DTNS P-I-X on Instagram. Yesterday, we mentioned a study that found disinformation campaigns on Twitter in 2016 had little to no effect. That's a big surprise for some of us. This contradicts what a lot of folks believe. So let's look at the study a little bit closer. It was led by the New York University Center for Social Media and Politics and uh, published in the journal Nature Communications. It was conducted by scientists from the University of Copenhagen, Trinity College, Dublin, and the Technical University of Munich, Germany. Tom, you're right up on this. And what are the sources of the info in the study? Yeah, so I know a lot of people who may may be seeing this going against what they previously believed will we'll have questions. Uh, the study looked at disinformation spread mostly by the Internet Research Agency, or IRA. That is a group with alleged links to the Russian government. There were a few other smaller campaigns that were part of this as well, linked to groups in China, Venezuela, and Iran. Uh, to identify which accounts were engaged in disinformation, they used Twitter's identification of foreign influence campaign accounts. Uh, so however you feel about how Twitter identifies those, uh, that's how you would feel about how they were identified for this study. As for people's attitudes and exposure, they use data collected by YouGov uh, from 1,500 representative U.S. voters, representative of the demographics of U.S. voters. They use surveys to measure their attitudes and beliefs, and the respondents approved access to their Twitter accounts, and that's how they were able to measure information. Surveys were conducted in April 2016, and then again in October 2016, so you could measure whether their attitudes changed. And then a third survey was conducted after the election that just asked, who'd you vote for, or, or or did you vote? The study only looked at individual attitudes. It did not attempt to measure other effects that may have occurred, like whether you believe the the election was had integrity or anything like that. It was just looking like how, how did your beliefs and support get changed if they got changed? All right. So we've got a couple different surveys, uh, April 2016, October 2016, and anecdotal information. So, Tom, let's get into more about what they actually did find. Well, it wasn't anecdotal. Uh, that, that's the thing is this was very scientifically done. It was self-reported. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. The main finding was that Russian disinformation campaigns on Twitter in 2016 reached very few users. Not that many people saw it. And there was, quote, no evidence of a meaningful relationship between exposure to the Russian foreign influence campaign and changes in attitudes, polarization, or voting behavior. Uh, in fact, exposure to information from the media in the U.S. and politicians themselves vastly outnumbered the exposures to disinformation. Study respondents were exposed to an average of four disinformation posts from the Internet Research Agency per day during the period studied. They were exposed to 106 posts per day from news media and 35 a day from U.S. politicians. So 25 times as much exposure to the media than disinformation posts. Uh, the study also found that 70 percent of exposures to disinformation reached a 1 percent of the users. So even the people who were seeing them, it was a very small number of people who were seeing them. Most of those users, too, of that 1 percent were identified as strong Republicans. So they were already reaching people who were already very firm in their beliefs. 
Okay, so that does tell us something about the reach of Twitter, uh, but how does Facebook uh, factor into this? Yeah, the, uh, that, that is a good question. The study did not look at Facebook data because Facebook does not make it easy to access its data. Uh, if you recall back in August 2021, Facebook shut down personal accounts of NYU researchers who were trying to study the spread of misinformation on that platform. So Facebook has actually combated efforts to study it. Uh, however, Facebook Facebook has released a little bit of information, and they included what they could in this report. Uh, they previously estimated that 126 million users had at least the potential to have viewed disinformation over a two-year period around 2016. And the paper, through its surveys and, and its measurements, estimates about 32 million U.S. Twitter users were exposed to the same kinds of posts in the eight months before the 2016 election. Now, you're talking about two years for 126 million and eight months for Twitter. That's so not exactly apples to apples. But back of the envelope calculation, uh, Facebook in 2016 had around three and a half times as many U.S. users as Twitter. So if you do that calculation, the reach is pretty similar on both platforms. Uh, and barring there being some other mechanic at play, it's probably the same reach on Facebook as it was on Twitter. So, okay. So we're talking about reach. Uh, is this the first study to point to little or no effect? Uh, that's, uh, not, uh, yeah, this is not the first study to do that. A study published in 2019 in PNAS, uh, found no evidence that interaction with IRA accounts substantially impacted six distinctive measures of political attitudes and behaviors over a one month period. Now that was looking at 2017. Uh, this is the first time we've looked at the period before the election in 2016. Uh, there have been some other studies out there that have said, oh, betting markets changed on Russian holidays. Maybe there was an effect. Uh, there's also studies around mm. the media response to hacks and leaks of information, but that's not related to social media platforms. Uh, so there's other evidence that other things were happening in the election, but all of the studies so far that say did social media posts have an effect have not been able to find an effect. This is really interesting stuff. I was thinking about this a lot since you and I talked about it in the morning show a little bit, just briefly. We've talked obviously a lot more here, but... Um, my grand takeaway is that people who are already pointing a certain direction with their opinions, regardless of that direction or party or side or whatever, were already there. And if you came along to them with something counter to that, they weren't going to suddenly go, oh, I see, I've seen the light. I'm now going to change my mind. Uh, or if they already supported a certain position, they were just having conf confirmation by hearing that. And all that it only turned out to be, for the most part, is... This social media just stuff just gave us all megaphones and let us all yell about it. And we got loud about it and everybody heard it. And the assumptions, I think, are natural that there was a bigger impact uh, than you'd think. But I think at the end of the day, people were still people and we probably weren't swayed that much. You don't usually have two people who diametrically oppose each other, show up at a table and then walk away completely changed in their opinions. They may find some new understanding, but for the most part, it stays the same. So I, part of me was surprised to hear this and part of me is not that surprised to hear this. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I certainly know, you know, myself included that, yes, if you, if you have feelings about anything, politics being, uh, you know, <laughs> incendiary topic, then yeah, you're not necessarily going to be swayed by, by anything that comes your way, whether it be from Facebook or Twitter or some other social media uh, entity that is, trying to sway you into either believing something or paying money for something. Uh, I don't know. I mean, in a way I feel like it's like, all right, well, this, this actually, all of this data shows that people just, you know, are resolute in their beliefs and good for them. Well, and whatever also, they may be. The other thing it shows is that these disinformation campaigns didn't reach that many people. There's a yeah. human bias we have when we see an example of something to think, oh, that one example must be replicated. And because I'm seeing it, everyone can see it. And so you have to counteract that bias and say, OK, just because I'm seeing an example doesn't mean it's widespread. How do I tell if it's widespread? You do this kind of study and see how many people actually saw it. And of the people who saw it, what effect did it have on them? And what the study found is not that many people saw it. And of the people who saw it, it didn't have much of an effect. Uh, what, what people did see was mainstream media. And what you don't hear anyone talking about anymore 
is what effect is 24 hour quote unquote news, which are really just entertainment channels having on people's beliefs? How does that sway people? Because those are the messages that people are seeing in way greater numbers on social media. Forget about the fact that they're also watching the television hours and hours a day. Uh, your, your, your information is coming from that source in huge amounts compared to to the disinformation that's on social media. I don't think that means we should undervalue to social media. I don't think it means this is the last word and, oh, disinformation is not a problem. But the amount of attention being given to disinformation on social media is way out of proportion to the actual information that seems to be having an effect on people. Yeah, I agree. And I also, uh, well, I don't know. I think you said it best. And, uh, and if, if, if there's anything that's changed about my attitude about this, in all this time, it's this one thing that it wasn't quite what I thought it was. Do you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, if there was any yeah. certainty, there was no certainty then. It always it just felt like chaos. But right now I'm like, no, maybe we were just all really loud and upset and in our different ways. And at the end of the day, we didn't really change any minds. I wonder if, if disinformation networks and bots, though, people that make that stuff, are they feeling a little failure right now? I would think so. I hope so. <laughs> I hope yeah. so. I don't think they, they probably can still point to the chaos unless and say I guess, that still I guess, feeds. I guess unless that motivates them to try harder and get better at it, which it well, might. That's a good so, point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would also like to see a study of, of what effect mainstream television news had on people's attitudes, beliefs, and polarization over the same period. I think that would be interesting. 100%. Yeah. Yep. Well, let's talk about eyes, shall we? The conversation has an article from senior lecturer of psychology at Royal Holloway University in London, Sonia Durant, called Eye Movement Science is Helping Us Learn How We Think. She says, uh, since the 1960s, scientists have been studying the way that eye movements potentially help decode people's thoughts. More recently, research in Germany showed eye tracking could help detect where somebody's at in their thinking process because they're able to track thought processes and can avoid life-threatening disconnects between humans and computers. Since then, infrared cameras and computer programs have made eye tracking easier and in the last few years have shown eye tracking can reveal a lot of things such as what stage somebody is at in their thinking. For example, in cognitive psychology experiments, people are often asked to find an object and an image. In a 2022 German study, results show eye tracking can distinguish between two phases of thinking. The ambient mode involves taking in information. Focal processing happens in the later stages of problem solving. Yeah, so uh, you know, it's it's basically uh, whether you're gathering information or trying to do trying to solve the problem, right? So. Potential uses of this combination could be uh, telling if somebody's tired, telling if someone's dyslexic, uh, telling if someone is stuck in a lesson uh, as a teaching aid and and being Mm -hmm. able to apply uh, some more, you know, some more help uh, to somebody. Or otherwise don't, you know, agree with, you know, you know, (laughs) the eyes have it, right? Always makes me think of... Someone's like, I don't really... I don't really agree with, you know, what we're going for here. Always makes me think of VR uses and eye tracking, obviously a big part of VR technology moving forward. Um, how this would affect you in game decisions and a, an AI slash computer recognizing what you think or mean by your eye movements and or expressions. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. We're getting better at being able to interpret what eye movements mean, and we're getting better at being able to track eye movements for good or for ill. <laughs> yeah. Those are both. Remember great. back in the day when it was like, if someone's lying, they blink a lot. Yep. And you go, Poker okay. Yeah. This, so this is just, you know, a natural progression of that based <laughs> on technology that we have uh, access to now. Well, Scott, um, I don't think that you're ever lying to us. Um, if you are, just <laughs> blink a lot and it'll be more obvious. But uh, thank you for being with us today. Let folks know where they can keep up with the rest that you do. Well, uh, good news, everybody. My final beta deck came in for the game Dungeon Yay. Murder, which means a little more play testing, a little bit of more tweaking. But it's almost ready for Kickstarter. If you would like to follow along with my uh, fun new card game that can play up to five people, two to five people, uh, ages eight and up, uh, go check it out, dungeonmurder.com. There's a video there and some other information. I'll have some more stuff up very shortly, but we are coming down to the moment of reality for that thing. So if that sounds interesting, you like your tabletop games, check it out. Once again, that is dungeonmurder.com. 
Sounds good for a lot of the folks who listen to this show. Uh, speaking of folks who listen to the show, we have a couple brand new bosses to thank. Those bosses are Kenny and LTJM. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you, LTJM. Both started backing us on Patreon, and we could not be happier to have you. I posted on Twitter uh, yesterday. I was like, I don't know. If you start backing us on Patreon, you might get your name in the show today. And Kenny just, just, d- d- he almost made it into yesterday's show. So I'm glad we got him in today's show. Thank you, Kenny. And LTJM as well. I don't know if you saw that post as well. Thank you both. Indeed. Speaking of patrons, uh, do stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet, where we talk about all the things. But just a reminder, on DTNS, you can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern at 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>